And once again I say greetings. It's been brought to my attention that there's a subject that needs further attention and that is what we will do in this our time together. Our study will be in begin in the book of John 16. The subject of worlds appears as though there's, there may be a separation of thought like only one place matters or only one world matters or the subject of worlds may be confusing. In John 16, earlier, or well, in the last session, I mentioned John 16, verse 28. John 16, 28. John 16, verse 28, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Or study will revolve around this subject of where we need to be, of why Christ said this, why he took the time to specifically say this, not just once, but repeatedly. Or study will revolve around this so that we can know where we need to be and where we do not need to be. And to just review just for a little bit from the first session that we had of what the world is, Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah 15, sorry, 51, verse 15. Jeremiah 51. Jeremiah 51 and verse 15. Jeremiah 51 and verse 15. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heaven by his understanding. The world we learned is not actually the or a literal world. Christ came into the world, yes, but this would be completely pointless for us just to consider or believe that he came into a natural world. Where is the life in that? Where is the depth? Where is the... the the benefit for us in that. Christ came into a world, the religion, the wisdom of the living God's religion, the world of that practice. Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. Book of Proverbs, chapter 3. Proverbs 3. Verse 19 and 20, Proverbs 3, 19 and 20, The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up, and the clouds drop down the dew. Christ came into the world of the living God's knowledge. But there is a clear division made between what exists on earth and what exists above the earth. Looking at Psalms 115. Psalms 115, please, Psalms 115, Psalms 115, 15 and 16, Psalms 115, 15 and 16, ye are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to who? The children of men. Above the earth is called the heavens, plural. This is where God, His Son and Minister, and His sons and daughters by creation, by His Spirit, live. But on earth, this is where the children of men exist. We further understand this division from the same book, Psalms 33. 33rd division of Psalms. Psalms 33, Psalms 33, 13 to 15, Psalms 33, 13 to 15, the Lord looked down from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men from the place of his habitation. He looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. The church or habitation of God is what is called the heavens. Or, as we might be familiar with in the book of Ephesians, heavenly places in Ephesians chapter 1. 
Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. The book of Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Jumping down to verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you might know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Hebrews 8 is where we are going to turn to at this point because it explains fully what we're looking at. In Hebrews 8. In Hebrews 8. Everything spoken of mirrors something. Hebrews 8. 1 and 2. Hebrews 8. 1 and 2. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. This is what we're looking for, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, and not man. The places of the living God are broken down into two places. The first is called the sanctuary, the second is called the true tabernacle. And in Hebrews 9, just one chapter over, we get a better understanding of this. Verse 1, chapter 9 of Hebrews, verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veal, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. Paul specifically mentions in verse 1 that under the first covenant there was a worldly sanctuary. And he does so because we today live under a new will of the living God that has a heavenly sanctuary, a heavenly temple. The tabernacle on earth that was erected by Moses was simply a figure of what existed above and beyond all realm. Looking at Exodus 25. Exodus 25. Looking at Exodus 25. Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9. Exodus 25, 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So envision. Moses saw this sanctuary. Everything that Moses saw, he put together for the Hebrew people. And when he saw what he saw, he saw two rooms. He saw one temple holding two rooms or two places. Exodus 26. Exodus 26. Exodus 26, verse 30. And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof which was showed thee in the mount. 33. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the taches, and that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide between you. The veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And thou shalt put the table on the north side. These things are important to know because they inform us of Christ's present employment. The only individuals who went to appear before God the Father, just as he repeatedly said, them that only appeared before God the Father on behalf of the Father's people were his high priests. This is why Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 7 this specific understanding for us to understand. 
Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7 and verse 20. Hebrews 7 and verse 20. And in as much as not without an oath he was made priest. Verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him that said unto him. The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jumping down. 23. And they truly were many priests. Because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. And this. But this man. This man, our high priest, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. We do have an high priest, particular only to one God, which allows us to understand that God and his priest occupy different yet operating roles. This is why John's revelation of Christ is ridiculously valuable. Looking at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. If we are not seeing Christ as an high priest to the living God, we open up ourselves to worship or imagination. Revelation 1. Revelation 1 and verse 12 and 13. Revelation 1, 12 and 13. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. We just read about these. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. The paps are another word for the term breast. And Christ is dressed in a familiar way to only one type of person, as is described in Exodus 28. Exodus 28 and verse 1. Exodus 28 and verse 1 through 5. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithmar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and a broidered coat, a mitre, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me." in the priest's office, and they shall take gold, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen. 28, 28 through th- to 30, and they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof, unto the rings of the ephod, with a lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate be not loose from the ephod. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart. When he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually, and thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart. When he goeth in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. This revelation allows us to understand that Christ is not just Christ. But he is Christ, God's high priest. This is important to know because Christ today serves a God and is not that God. Nowhere in scripture will we find any record of a high priest of God worshipped by the people as God, nor is there any strange commission given afterwards. And because he today fills Aaron's position, was Aaron worshipped as God? Did Aaron believe he was God? Christ is high priest for the same God of Aaron, and his duties include that found in Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Looking at Second Chronicles. The way that all of this will connect will be ridiculously lovely. Second Chronicles thirteen. Second Chronicles thirteen. Second Chronicles thirteen eight. 2 Chronicles 13 verse 8 
Now ye think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David, and ye be a great multitude, and there are with you golden calves which Jeroboam made you for gods. Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron, and the Levites, and have made you priests after the manner of the nations of other lands, so that whosoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, the same may be a priest of them that are no gods, but as for us. The Lord is our God, and we, will, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests which minister unto the Lord are who? The sons of Aaron. And the Levites wait upon their business, and they burn unto the Lord every morning, and every evening burnt sacrifices and sweet incense. The showbread also set they in order upon the pure tables, the candlestick of gold with the lamps thereof to burn every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. These are, this is, and always will be Aaron's host of workers. First Chronicles 23 First Chronicles 23 First Chronicles 23. First Chronicles 23 in one verse in verse 13. The sons of Amram, Aaron and Moses, and Aaron was separated that he should sanctify the most holy things, he and his sons forever to burn incense before the Lord to minister unto him and to bless in his name forever. Remember this. Remember this to bless in his name forever. Remember this saying and remember who was associated with this saying. There is only one God to be worshipped as God and one high priest to be honored as the head of that church. This is why in 1 Corinthians 15 we find Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 and 27. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But, but, when he saith all things are put under him, Christ is high priest, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. It makes absolutely no sense. For an high priest to be exalted above the God that he honors. It makes absolutely no sense for an high priest to call himself God. Who anointed Christ into his position? Did Christ anoint himself? Did Aaron anoint himself? Let's get to the fact of the matter in Psalms 110. Psalms 110. Language is terribly important. Psalms 110. Psalms 110, verse 1. Psalms 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord. Two characters, two figures. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Verse 4. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Christ tells us repeatedly that he goes to his father to explain to faithful individuals the office that he was supposed to pick up in his direct presence. It was the Lord his God, the same God of Aaron and Moses and Shem and Adam, that resurrected him from the grave and brought him into his church for priestly consecration. But he didn't just resurrect Christ to bring him into his church for just this one title. We read in Psalms 11, this also is key, Psalms 11, Psalms 11 and one verse, Psalms 11 verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven. The Father brought his chief apostle to his throne. And because God's throne is within his temple, this is where Christ was brought to. 
being brought to his throne and they're anointed, he's not just a priest, but he's a royal ruler, a prince. And here is the word, a king. So should God, the king of both heaven and earth, complicate his own regime by anointing another king similar to himself? Language and context is important in scripture. Always or else we will strangely reveal our heart by the vanity that we honor. Looking at John 12, we're going to investigate this. He's a king. Yes. But a king of what? John 12. John 12. John 12. John 12. The book of John 12, 12 and 13. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that, what? Cometh in the name. We've seen this before. And we haven't just seen this before. We've seen this one that comes in the name of the living God. We've seen it associated with someone. We just saw it. When we observe Christ as a king, it's well to observe that his reign does not escape the fact that he comes and is presented in the name of the living God. Luke 19. Luke 19. Luke 19. Luke 19, 36 to 38. And he went, and as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. He is the King pronouncing peace and glory in heaven. We now know what heaven is which is the highest temple of the living God this is why he's classed not just with Aaron but with Melchizedek it's important for us to know who Melchizedek is looking at Genesis 14 Genesis 14 Genesis 14 Genesis 14, 18, and 19. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. This Melchizedek is the king of Salem. What is Salem? Psalms 76. He is the, he is the king of Salem. Psalms 76. Psalm 76, Psalms 76, verse 1 and 2. In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place is in Zion. Salem is in reality the shortened version of the name Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is another name for Zion. This Melchizedek was the king of the tabernacle, the king of the church, of Salem, of Jerusalem. When we hear Christ compared to this individual, when we hear that Christ is king, it's lawful to study the context of language. To be a king of a church or a temple means that one is the chief leader of that church. The word king is not a literal term but it's used to express essence. If it was a literal term, Christ would be an apostate. Christ stands in the name of the Lord his God as the prince-priest of his name. For the Father to bring him up and into his heavenly places, it's language, it's language signifying a promotion of position. It's, it's exactly what Paul says in Colossians 1. Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1, looking at Colossians, 
Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17 and 18. And in verse 17, He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. His room is ecclesiastical. It does not escape the church of the living God. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, the book of Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1, 20 to 22, Ephesians 1 verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and Every name that is a name, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, where? Gave him, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Chapter over, Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto who? The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? 21, Ephesians 3, 21, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. There is plainly no other God honored in God's church than the living God and the Father of our High Priest. This is important to know because this religion, his religion and its order exists only where the Father is. It does not completely and will never fully exist where we are on earth. Not the sons of God, but to the sons of men is the earth given. We can now jump to Isaiah 32 and make sense of this promise. Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32, Isaiah 32, verse 18. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. This is our home. This is the home of our faith and the development of our mind and character after the likeness of of or desire Isaiah 33 Isaiah 33 Isaiah 33 20 to 22 look where look upon Zion the city of our solemnities thine eyes shall see Jerusalem a quiet habitation a tabernacle that shall not be taken down not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed neither shall any one of the cords thereof be broken but there The glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. For the Lord, he he is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Language in context. Important. The living God is king over what exists on earth and in heaven But he anointed his son to be the head over his throne religion in heaven for our good benefit on earth. God himself is a civil ruler over his church and state. Say that again. The living God is a civil ruler over his church and state. Christ, on the other hand, is the ecclesiastical ruler and governor of God's church. It is absolutely unlawful for him as a ruler of a church to pick up a civil civil office. This is why God himself would not and did not consecrate him over anything but his church. And this is not a new thought because this was prophesied of him in Micah chapter 5. Micah 5. These things are ridiculously wonderful. Micah, Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5 and verse 4. 
and he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Zechariah, this same thought is in Zechariah, Zechariah, Zechariah 6, Zechariah 6, 12 and 13, Zechariah 6, 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man who, whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and sit and rule upon his throne. How? What throne? He shall be a priest upon his throne. Christ cannot be separated from his God. To do so would leave us without a God in existence and a lifeless Christ pretending to have a form of godliness, which is, in fact, the plight of modern theology. Christ attached to God lets us know the God that we are to be surrendered to for our health, personal and devotional. And it is that God revealed by the Ten Commandments. But how? How can I say this? How can we believe this? Where is Christ set on? Where is his office located? Specifically, where is it located in 1 Peter? 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter Chapter 3, 22, one verse, part A, part A of 22. Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Back to Hebrews 8. Christ is on the right hand of God. Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, verse 1. Now this is the sum which we have spoken. We have such an high priest who is set where? on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, the full confession is right here for us. Christ rules the right hand of God, but what is that right hand? What is he set on? Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. The 33rd division of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 2. Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousand of saints from his right hand, went a fiery law for them. Christ's office, like Christ's office, is set on the same hand that gave mankind ten reflections of God's character. To see Christ as a high priest is to see a chief representative of the Ten Commandments, which commandments let us know what God is to be honored by the sign of his fellowship, even that fourth commandment of the seventh day. Without God we worship a mysterious Lord and God which literally translates to the name Baal, who was honored on the ancient day of the sun in Rome, which is today for us, we know, and back then was called Sunday, and goes by the modern name of Jesus. This is the routine for what exists in the world presently. Yet Christ came into the world and left the world. He came into the world and left the world to be the chief ambassador of the seventh-day religion of the God of the Bible. And he didn't come into the world of Baal worship per se, although in Judah, where he was born, Baal worship did exist. So basically, he conquered the entire world, Jew and Gentile, and brought all things right back to where he is, because he is not here anymore. Jeremiah 23 Jeremiah 23, 
Jeremiah 23, where he is, is where we should be. Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 23 and 26 and 27, Jeremiah 23, 26, how long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to do what? To forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten me for who? For Baal. This is the reason why the world needed a savior. The name of the living God had been forgotten until his son was injected into the world. Jeremiah 19. Jeremiah 19. Jeremiah 19. 3 through 5. Jeremiah 19, 3, and say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the which whosoever heareth his ear shall tingle. Because they have forsaken me, and have, es- and have estranged this place, and have burned incense in it unto other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and have filled this place with the blood of innocence. They have built also the high places of who? Baal, to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mouth, my mind. Christ, whenever people claiming to serve the God of the Bible are found in religious apostasy, they always turn themselves to worship Baal. This is a fact emphasized throughout the Bible. Christ was necessary. Looking at Jeremiah 7. Looking at Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7, 8 through 11. 8. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. This is that religion of Baal mingled with their religion. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto who? Baal. And walk after other gods whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? No. Second Kings 17. Second Kings 17. A full testimony. Second Kings 17. Second Kings 17, 13 to 16. Second Kings 17, 13 to 16. Verse 13. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn you from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, which I sent you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear. They hardened their necks like to the necks of their father. Their fathers, they did not believe. They did not believe in the Lord their God. They rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. They followed vanity. They became vain. They went after the heathen that were, not, that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had, not, had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served that pestilent Baal. We know an apostate religious sect claiming themselves to be of the God of the Bible by their devotion to Baal. The people would honor the seventh day and then the next day, the day of the God of the Son, the first day of that Roman deity, the people offered what they would offer and praise whatever they did. Christ's mission was to strip away the vanity 
from that wisdom created in Eden. Eden's name and the God of Eden had been mishandled grotesquely. His labors were not in Rome or anywhere else, but in Judah. And to prove this, Acts 10, he did not go anywhere else and he could not go anywhere else. Because nowhere else on earth, Acts chapter 10, were God's people. Acts 10. Acts chapter 10, 38 and 39. 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree, could not go anywhere else because only the Jews had Eden's religion and only Jews stood guilty as the only ones violating that practice because they were the only ones given it. Paul, in the book of Romans chapter 9, states this fact in plain words. Romans 9. Romans 9. The book of Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, 3 through 5. Romans chapter 9, verse 3. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who are they? Who are Israelites? To whom, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Who are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came. There is no other Christ but him of that Hebrew religion devoted to that Hebrew God, who is in reality the only God in existence. To subscribe to Christ is to honor the Hebrew God. To subscribe to vanity is to honor modern Baal, who acts as God or a God and fools his people into believing that he is something superior to God when he is but a non-existent imagination. Something drawn up by Nimrod. Christ was sent into the world, into a world deceived by Satan. No religious error, error will exist or ever exist where God is. But just, just remember, just remember how God cast out Satan where he cast him out too. And on that subject, this deception isn't physical, deception is mental. Satan is a religion. That dragon and devil, as this practice is symbolized by these names, it's a subtle craft causing the heart and mind to deviate from God. Just as God's throne, religion is above the earth, language telling of a clear separation of matters, of, of manners. So also in the beginning God separated the waters from the dry land. And this statement is the confession of God's host, Jonah, the book of Jonah. We know who we honor by this confession of faith, the book of Jonah. Book of Jonah, there's Daniel, there's Hosea, there's Amos, there's Joel, there's Amos, and then there's Jonah. The book of Jonah. Chapter 1 and verse 9. Jonah 1, verse 9. He saith unto them, I am an Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. The true reformer, the true worshiper, Hebrew, in manners of worship and service. Just as Paul says, a Jew inwardly, circumcised in the heart of the spirit of the mind. They are where God is. Where their God is not, and where His Son is not, there will be religious confusion. This is what Christ was trying to tell us. I go to my Father. I have first been in the world. Now I leave. As long as I am in the world, 
There's light. But I am not. Error. To further understand, we see Revelation 17, this division. This division that we're, that I just, that we're mentioning. This division of waters or sea and dry land. Revelation 17. Revelation 17. Revelation 17 and verse 15. Revelation 17 and verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. Waters or seas, these are figurative illustrations of religious denominations. These denominations are specific. Specific to a, a certain brand of people. Isaiah 60. Isaiah Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60 and verse 5. Isaiah 60 and verse 5. Thou, then thou shalt see and flow together in thine heart, shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. When we see the sea, we're in reality seeing Gentile religious denominations, kindreds of religious sects, people of a religious creed and dogma. Gentiles do not honor the living God or any living God, but they honor gods of their imagination in strange ways. In 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, we get a glimpse into this manner of worship. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, 3 and 4. 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked, carried ourselves personally and devotionally in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. So also this is plain in Ephesians chapter 4, even plainer, Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, 17 to 19, Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. The sea is separated and always will be from the dry land, the earth of the living God's religious practice, because of the God that is in the sea. Isaiah 27. Isaiah. Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27 and verse 1. Isaiah 27 and verse 1. In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. This dragon is specifically connected to a brand of a religion. In Ezekiel 29. Ezekiel 29, Ezekiel 29, 2 and 3, Ezekiel 29, 2 and 3, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. What? The great dragon that lies in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is my own. And I have made my river, I have made it for myself. The dragon. The dragon is representative of, of Egypt. And Egypt is, of course, figurative language expressing a dark religion and religious bondage. These are them that, and this is that practice, 
that cultivated a mysterious honor to a woman called Isis and her son called Horus, and who had a man as the chief representative of the sun god and of the son of the sun god, who fulfills that spoken of in Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What we're seeing is an individual holding a position both civilly and ecclesiastically. And doing so in error. We understand that today Isis goes by the name of Mary and Horus goes by the name of Jesus and their appointment is still honored on the day of the sun. This is the manner of our present world. Yet Christ came in a time when God's religion and Baal's religion were one entity just as it sadly still is leaving him to be the one to sweep away the trash from the Lord's room to expose to sincere hearts the right seventh day faith of the God and King of both heaven and earth heaven is utterly untouchable because no error can exist there But where we are, there's no such thing as a practice that cannot and will never be innately carnal. God's earth was covered with rubbish and it was Christ's responsibility and it still is as his high priest to clean up that rubbish that the name of the living God may dawn upon our hearts and minds. He came into the world, the wisdom of the mind, the wisdom of the living God's practice and by one sacrifice abolished the taint associated to the religion of his god but when he left it's not that he only it's not that he he was the only thing brought up to god but god's religion also came up with him and set him along with that religion he that that the embodiment of the living god's religion is set by the throne of the living god meaning that religion is today a civil law to follow looking at Luke 24 the Lord literally brought up his man to himself and Christ does not abide by him with flesh different than ours heaven and earth are joined by one body literally Christ wears or flesh and bones Luke 24 Luke 24:39 Luke 24:39 Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have a man literally stands in the direct presence of God for us and this is why it's vanity to exalt Christ to a position not given him for what man is worshiped as God especially one that is his high priest The entire point of God's faith is to lead us in an experience where we can, where we can and are supposed to absolutely escape the religious world to know the praise of heaven. I can only say this because Peter first taught it in 2 Peter. 2 Peter 2 Peter 19 and 20 Speaking of them that govern the earth while they promise them liberty second peter 2:19 they themselves are the servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage for if after they have done what escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the lord and savior jesus christ they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than the beginning or subscription to what exists on earth 
is not ideal for the true believer. This is why Paul let us know, he lets us know in Philippians 3, one verse, in part A of Philippian, Philippians 3. Part A of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3 and verse 20. Or conversation is where? If we're honest. In heaven. If we want Him and love Him. If we want us and love us. If we want health after His manner of health. Or conversation is where He is. Because He left and he's not where we might think he is, because he's not there. Colossians 3. Again, Paul is hammering this thought into us. Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. If you then, if, such a sad word, if, who would not be? If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. The if is necessary because Satan deceiveth the whole world. If we are caught up in that deception, we will not be where our high priest is, and he is found on the right hand of God, where a distinction is clearly made between the God that is within the sea and the God that is above. That God in the sea is a mysterious craft after the sun, and he will make known his practice on the day of the sun which is why it is called Sunday. But that living God, where the living Christ, His High Priest, is with the seventh day is His sign of power. The seventh day is the sign of His name. Yet that deception would cast that name aside. This is why if we are truly faithful, we receive the same call that Abraham received in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12. Genesis 12. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And verse 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Again, house is another name or illustration figuratively for church. Where to evacuate, most definitely. Whatever part of the sea we are in and follow God's man into the place where he is by our faith. He's not down here as he is up there. Neither will he be unless through us. This is the entire reason for his faith, for the process of sanctification and the education attached to it. John 17 18 John 17 18 John 17 and verse 18 As thou hast sent me into the world even so have I also sent them into the world He is not in the religious world He is gone But as we learn of Him and his God in the place where he is, his mission becomes our own and opens up the way for the world to have a chance to know God, even as he offered the world that, that, that same very chance. Final verse. This is why he said in Matthew 5, 
this our commission. Matthew 5. Matthew 5, final verse. Verse 6. Matthew 5, 13 and 14. Matthew 5, 13. You are the what of the earth? The salt of the earth. Salt gives flavor. If the earth needs salt, the earth is unsavory. This is not where we're supposed to be because he's not there. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You are the what of the world? The light of the world. The world has no light in it. Why are we still in the world if there is no light in it? If there's no light in the world and we are yet in it, that means that we are own are dark. We need help in our heart. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. 16. Let your light so shine before men. What men? The same men that the living God gave this earth to. The same men that rule this world. The same men that do not know Him. If they did know Him, there would be no need to say, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify who? Your Father which is where? If this is our Father, then this applies to us. All of this applies to us. If this is our Father, all of this applies to us. If this is not our Father, then He should be. And our hearts should know humility and quietness for simplicity. The whole point of God's faith is to form creations after His name and the likeness of His Son to heal the earth of His practice because Baal still infiltrates it. These things are terribly important to know and consider. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, who art in heaven, you who art in the most holy place with your high priest, thank you for every single blessing that you have given us. Thank you for your offering that we may have the opportunity to come up higher in mind than in person that we may know you that we may know your name the fellowship of your joys and sufferings that we may be brought into conformity to your death that we may be risen to have the life of you and your Son fill us. Where you are, gather us. We don't know as we ought to know. Define for us, define, define to us the manner of love that you have bestowed upon us. Because we will hear we will not turn away. Thank you for sitting with us and for sharing with us and for healing our understanding that we may take the necessary steps to heal ourselves. That we may stop dishonoring ourselves by either willingly or ignorantly dishonoring you. Train us up by your Spirit and fill us with the name of your Son and with the mind that surrounds your throne. Is my prayer, is our prayer in the high name of your Son and Chief Minister. Amen.